What's going on everyone? Austin John please here and today it's going to be time for the analysis of the Pokemon Presents that was presented to us yesterday, August 18th, 2021. <laughs> In this video, we're going to be focusing pretty much strictly on the BDSP, the Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl footage. And in a subsequent video today, we are going to be going into a very long analysis on the Legends Arceus stuff. Because, well, that's a brand new game, not a remake, and there's a lot of things to analyze there. In this video, I am going to be using YouTube's playback feature, and we're going to be slowing it down, and we're going to be going over all the very important things that you should know and that are present inside of this trailer. And also the, the subsequent, you know, little presentation explanation that they did. If you didn't see the deep dive and details on the website yesterday, definitely recommend checking that out. Hopefully I have a, a link showing up right about here. And after watching that, you can come back here and you're gonna be a little bit more informed on what's going on, especially if you didn't play the first game, like I did. But I've been doing a lot of research over the last 24 hours, so I'm very informed on what's going on here. The first thing that we need to talk about is the stark difference between the graphic style now and what the graphic style was on the original trailer that we were shown. Here, it looks flat, there's no real depth to things. And now there is a large bokeh effect because of the depth of field. So further away is going to appear more blurry and the one focus point, which for right now appears to be uh, the actual house right here, is much more in focus. And that's the reason that, you know, it doesn't appear blurry or foggy of sorts. If we were to look at the actual building and the textures itself, you can see that the texture along all of these shingle pieces, you have much more bright highlights. It gives it much more of a stark contrast so you can see the individual shingles and it kind of brings the roof to life compared to what it used to look like. We now see a scene that involves Professor Rowan inside of his lab and we can see the male protagonist here without his hat. I don't really know if that's going to be a super important thing. Maybe you are going to be able to customize your trailer from very early in the game. But this scene right here on how to get your starter Pokemon, this is Professor Rowan's briefcase. And this scene is exclusive to Diamond and Pearl and it is absent in Platinum. It is the first sign that this is going to be just a Diamond Pearl remake not a Platinum remake, which has many adverse implications, but there may be things from Platinum involved in this game, and I'm gonna explain that more in just a little bit. In addition, this scene right here happens almost immediately after the player is walking over to the lake, and this is from the February trailer as opposed to the trailer now, and it does appear as though we now have the ability to customize our trainer from very early in the game possibly, or your character's, I don't know, just not dressed or just doesn't have his hat on yet before actually reaching this area, which is at the very start of the game, even before you get your starter, which happens right here. I'm not going to be spending too much time talking about how much better the game and the art style look compared to the previous trailer. It is just obvious everywhere and everyone that I've spoken to is very happy with the overhaul. This is a very, very important scene that appears on screen for about half a second. And the reason that this scene is so important is because this is the Great Marsh, which is sort of like a safari zone of this region. And the reason I say it's so important is because in Diamond and Pearl, there's a completely different marsh zone compared to Platinum. And this individual scene right here of this player going into this mud surrounded by these four trees, a cliff right here, and then additional trees at the bottom is only present in the Diamond Pearl. It is right here. Area number three. The player is going into this deep mud located right here. The corresponding area in Pokemon Platinum does not have that tree and cliff configuration, not only in three, but nowhere in the marsh whatsoever. This is the second thing that's making me believe that it is truly a Pokemon Diamond Pearl remake and nothing to do with Platinum except for the Pokedex and possibly some post-game stuff, but we have no idea about the post-game stuff at this time. This is the first scene that we are actually seeing a character's Pokemon following you around. They did not reveal this in the February trailer. Instead, this is something that was just presented to us that you are going to be able to have a following Pokemon. The language that they use to explain it 
may be somewhat confusing to people because uh, I've even had people in chat like asking about exactly what it means, like how do you choose the Pokemon. There's two possible things. One, you're going to be able to choose the specific Pokemon from your party in a similar style to how it was in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee versus just the first Pokemon in your party who is not fainted. They're going to be following you around. I don't know exactly which it's going to be. I am kind of indifferent to either one because I'm usually going to have my starter in the beginning of my party anyways. Speaking of starters, this character chose the best one, the blue one. We could also see here that the Pokemon following dynamic is a little bit more advanced than, you know, you would expect to see it in like Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Instead, it seems more in line with what we saw in the Isle of Armor, that this Pokemon isn't following the exact path that the player just took which you are fixed to eight different directions, but instead it looks like the Pokemon is just going to track you and walk in the closest direction to you. So instead of Piplup going this way, it's going to cut through this way. In fact, we could see that the player is running almost to the full right side of this last fifth flower, and Piplup is cutting through the fourth flower. So the Pokemon is following you dynamically, it is not following a fixed course and it's not directly behind you like it was in previous games. This scene right here involves the trainer not throwing out a Pokeball, but instead putting their hand out and we can see the Pipple up here, which leads me to believe that it is in fact the first Pokemon of the party and you know, it wouldn't make sense for you to throw it out because it's already out of its Pokeball. So you just begin the battle and it's just standing there just like it was in Isle of Armor. I kind of do love this classic versus screen that pops up though. I really like that. The lighting effects are so much better in the actual battle screens like there's actual depth to her hair instead of you know it just being a flat texture where you can see some light coming here which casts shadows to the right and in addition if you noticed the shadow at the bottom is dynamic it's not just a round circle of where the player is standing and i believe that remains true for the pokemon and now in this scene the lighting isn't casted from the sun as it was on that last before instead they are ceiling lights and it is shining directly down on top of the gym leader here, which has a bright area at the top of the helmet, as well as the top of his arms, which then casts the shadow downward. So it does seem like different scenes and different animations will have different lighting effects, which is really, really nice. Once again, we can see the dynamic shadow beneath the player, and just like before, how the shadow was casted to the side of the lass and to the front left of the hiker, it is directly below this gym leader because the light is directly above him. And in this scene right here, we can see below Kranidos, it does have a dynamic shadow. It is not just a circle. Very, very nice. To compare and contrast this with previous Pokemon games, in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, Pokemon in the overworld would always have a shadow, a dynamic shadow, and this Tauros has a dynamic shadow below him. And looking to Pokemon Sword and Shield, we could see that in the battles, the Pokemon did have dynamic shadows beneath them, as we saw right there. In addition to the overworld, sometimes there are shadows, sometimes there's less shadows, depending on the actual weather that's going on. Hey, it's Austin from a while ago. Hey, Austin from a while ago. I'm Austin now. And in the future, I'm going to be Austin from a while ago, and that's going to be Austin from a long while ago. However, we can see right here that when a Pokemon uses a move that does emit light, it does not modify the shadows at all. That's just not something that the game does. It could, but it doesn't. The feature for putting stickers on the Pokeball that will have custom animations when you throw out a Pokemon does seem really awesome. Once again, you are limited to 20 stickers. You're also able to edit this in a 2D plane or on a 3D plane, which leads me to believe that you're only decorating the front. Even in the battle scenes that do exist at night, we are seeing shadows casted from the trainer because of, I guess, moonlight or whatever. Although it doesn't appear as though a lot of things in the background have shadows. Like if we look at this tree up here, there's no shadow being casted from it. Ugh, uh, the trainers look so much better now. Sometimes all you need is a little bit of lighting. Every Instagram model could tell you that. Here we see a little bit of the union room and wow, I was like, wait, they're all just circles. And then I saw those pigtails. So nope, definitely not just circles. <laughs> it would also appear that we have a Nurse Joy-like character in the corner, most likely for healing your Pokemon, or this is a representative and this person you speak to for you to actually leave. It is at this point unclear the difference between the union room and 
Uh, the phrase for the other room, I believe it was the global room, but let's look into that more accurately. Yes, the global room. Trainers around the world can use online communications to gather in a single room for Pokemon trades, battles, and other activities. As opposed to the union room is a facility where you can enjoy battling and trading Pokemon with other trainers through the Nintendo Switch's local communication or online communication. I'm still not 100% sure the difference between the two options. We get our first look at the what we could assume to be the closet inside of the style shop where you have access to a few different styles here. We don't know how much much you're going to be able to customize if it's just the cyber style is the entire outfit and you're not going to be able to choose individual clothing so the outfit style is going to be more similar to let's go pikachu and eevee than it is in sword and shield we also do see for a fact that the style translates to when you're in the overworld as the little chibi sprite and when you are in the battle screens as well next we are shown the explorer kit and this is something that you get in the game and it looks like from anywhere in the overworld you are able to drop down. At the top left we do see a mini map that is present with a whole bunch of large question marks that exist. We see a few glistening places and we can see in the very position is most likely our trainer's location. On the map, once the player is approaching one of these diamond shaped patterns, we are going to see that the screen flashes a little bit to kind of notify you of it and it's going to be appearing on screen. This is a small mini game that you're going to be able to chisel away and use a hammer to get gems as well as fossils and most likely other items. One additional feature of the underground is that you're going to be able to make a secret base and decorate it with statues that you find from the fossil digging process. I've searched through all of the footage here and I've compared the Pokedex between Pokemon Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl, everything confirmed so far, the original Diamond and Pearl, and in addition, Pokemon Platinum. Even though Diamond and Pearl and Platinum did have the national Pokedex, you were able to get a lot of Pokemon, but each one is missing, I think, between 50 and 60. I have the list in front of me right now. But in neither of the games are you actually able to obtain the Bulbasaur line, the Squirtle line, or the Charmander line. Which is interesting because these statues are green, as opposed to these statues, which are gray, and these Pokemon are available in the game. It makes me wonder if these Pokemon are going to be special rewards, if they're going to be very rare treasure, or if there's going to be a specific way to get these statues. I think it'd be really, really neat, although very, very big long shot, if you're able to use the Amiibos from Super Smash Brothers for Charizard, Squirtle, and Ivysaur to get these specific statues, that would be super dope, but pff, not going to be a thing, I guarantee you. And now we're seeing the character going into a very, very large question mark area as opposed to the smaller question mark areas. Once the player has entered into this marsh-like underground area, we could see that it's actually revealed on the map. And there is a red circle right there. I don't know what that red circle is for, question mark. In addition, when they were still in the hallway, we saw no glistening spots here. But after the player enters the room, it does appear as if though, these four glistening spots just respawned. So are you going to be able to walk in and out of one of these large rooms to respawn these glistening spots over and over for you to be able to farm items? That'd be convenient. In this fun sort of, you know, flavor art that we had for the Grand Underground, if we were to look to the marsh-like area, which is located over here, it doesn't really appear to coincide with the map at all. But we do see that there is a very large area surrounded by much smaller areas. This leads me to believe that this flavor art that we're seeing here is not actually meant to be an accurate representation or, a, you know, a proper map of the underground area. Instead, it just kind of gives you the overall idea of what's going on. I do still think as if though there are going to be segregated areas like we do see here and we see all of these being connected. It does connect off screen here and most likely here as well. But it kind of looks like this upper area is going to be segregated from this area that we're in. Notice how everything here is highlighted in green and this area is not. In a subsequent scene, we are going to be seeing the same sort of thing. This whole area is highlighted in green because that's the system that you're in. And now we're going to be entering a smaller room. Inside of the smaller room, we see that it's filled with lava and not much else really. <laughs> Uh, we don't get enough of a scope yet to actually see the difference between the smaller squares and the very large square. Here we have another small square that involves a munchlax. 
This is very, very important. This Munchlax is very important. An original Diamond Pearl Platinum, or maybe just Platinum, not sure on that, I have to look into it. The only way to get a Munchlax in the game was for you to go around and slather honey on trees, which had a 10% chance that nothing would happen, and a 90% chance that in six real life hours you could not modify the DS's clock, a Pokemon would appear and Munchlax only had a 1% spawn rate. So that means that you have a 90% chance at a 1% chance after waiting six hours, and I think there's, what? 12 or 11 or 16 actual honey trees in the game and you do need to actually spend money in order for you to do this so from that of my knowledge also what john stone said in watching his video and getting every pokemon in these games this can be an extremely troublesome process although i do believe that there's a tool online for you to type in your trainer id and will tell you which of the trees i think there's only four can actually have a munchlax but it just seeing it here in the underground means that this pokemon is now readily more available next we see a small montage of in-game text about team galactic there's a really cool theme that plays right here. I'm not going to be playing it because I'm talking over everything going on. This double battle is a little interesting and it's specifically interesting because I looked at every single place that Team Galactic has a presence. And the only place that they have a presence that there is even a single beauty fly that's able to be in a double battle is present in Diamond and Pearl. However, the same grunt in Platinum has a Glammeow and a Houndour. And when looking at the Pokemon, a potential double battle with previous grunt, potential double battle with following grunt, this trainer does not have a dust ox. Instead, it's just a Stunky or Glammeow. However, funny enough, there is only one Grunt that could possibly be in a double battle who has a dust ox, once again, only present in Diamond and Pearl, and the same battle in Pokemon Platinum, Krogunk, Stunky, Glammeow. So it does look like as if though the battles are going to be very different or slightly different from what they were previously, as we see in this double battle here. Or maybe this is a post-game fighting area, I'm not really too sure. In this scene, we're seeing the trainer outside of what is most likely the Valley Windworks with one of the Galactic Grunts in front. However, we then get a sweeping overview of this area here. This scene right here, we are treated to, uh, what's the name of this place? The Team Galactic Headquarters, yes. Team Galactic Headquarters, and there's a receptionist right here, and there's a door, and there's a big Team Galactic logo on the floor. Very subtle, guys. Very, very subtle, right? And if we were to look at the original maps, comparing Diamond and Pearl versus Platinum, there is one stark contrast here, and that's the wall colors. In Platinum, they are gray, dark gray, and red lined. And then in Diamond and Pearl, they're just blue. And in the trailer, just blue. So just another thing that leads us to believe that this is just Diamond and Pearl, not Platinum. Here we see the leader of Team Galactic, Mount Cornet, three Pokemon. They're talking about the Lake Spirits and the Lake Spirits are involved with Dialga and Palkia and all that. In the fourth generation games of Sinnoh, there are a total of eight HMs. Cut Fly, Surf Strength, Defog, Rock Smash, Waterfall, and Rock Climb. This clip that we see right here, I believe is the only time we have actually seen the little uh, the little markers for rock climb. They have not addressed what they are going to be doing if they're keeping it true to the original and there are eight HMs that you have to get and essentially a third of your entire party is going to be HM sleeves. <laughs> or, uh, or if they're gonna be going an alternate route with some sort of, you know, overworld mechanic to get around obstacles like this, like they did in Sun and Moon. So we still don't know anything about that. This right here is one of the first two views that we have of the actual overlay for your battles, including the Pokemon's health, gender, HP bar, and in this individual scene, your Pokeball selection. And momentarily, we are going to be seeing the fight attack options as well. Okay, I was mistaken. It wasn't the actual uh, Pokemon and other selection screen. It was just the attack screen. There are a few things to note here. One, we no longer have the little icon that appears next to an attack that tells you if it's going to be super effective or not. And when comparing this to both Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, which seemed, you know, fun, big circular icons, and then Sword and Shield, 
it's a little bit more in line with Sword and Shield. Granted, they don't have these fun, cool diagonal angles over here. Instead, it has big round circular things over here. The circular style with the gray at the ends is very reminiscent of what it actually did look like during Diamond and Pearl. But of course, the move selection screen can look nothing alike because that was just its own individual screen with a whole bunch of touch stuff. So it's sort of a original inspired but newly adapted layout. I'm not gonna lie, I did get very used to the little thing where it always says if something is super effective or not. And now that it's not there, it's gonna, you know, make me think a little bit more when actually approaching these battles. Ah, this lighting. This lighting is dope. So dope. In addition, there were a lot of people wondering if the Pokedex is going to be pulling from Diamond and Pearl or if it's gonna be pulling from Platinum. The Sinnoh Dex of Diamond and Pearl only houses 151 Pokemon, of which Eevee and its evolutions are not present. And on this screen, we could clearly see Leafeon over here. And a bunch of people have asked, you know, is there gonna be all the Pokemon? We don't know. What are they gonna be doing with the Pokedex? What's gonna be available before, you know, completing the Sinnoh Dex? Is there going to be a national Dex that unlocks? It's unsure at this time if there is a national Dex that unlocks. However, there are two Pokemon that do appear in this content that leads me to believe that either, yes, there is going to be the national Dex or there's going to be a list of supported Pokemon or there's going to be an expanded Pokedex for this game. All of that's not 100% too sure yet, and something I'm gonna be bringing up later once I identify the Pokemon in this trailer. In this individual scene here, we do see that you can use touch controls to mind things up, and I think that's pretty neat. I just noticed something in this scene right here. We have this orb that appears at the front. I don't know if that's a decoration. I don't think it's a decoration. As soon as the player enters, we see that it's sort of just like white. And then, Snorlax is placed down, and then it appears gray. We do know for a fact that the statues that you put in here are going to affect the wild Pokemon that you find in the Grand Underground. The fact that it went from white to gray makes me believe that maybe now this means that there's an increase of normal type Pokemon. Then, with Charizard being added, it turns red, which leads me to believe that there's an increase of fire type Pokemon being available. Subsequently, when Venusaur appears, it does not change color. I'm not exactly too sure why. This is still a dynamic that's uh, a little bit of a mystery, but once the Turt wig is added, it appears green. And then when Chimchar is added, it appears back to red, but when Piplup is added, it does not change to blue, most likely because there's one water and two grass and two fire. Maybe you just had to do something with the fact that this is a Jade statue and maybe that counts for a credit of three in the fire category. This is a large statue, which counts for a credit of two. These are small statues, which count for a credit of one. No idea yet, but I think there's gonna be a deep dynamic to this. Yeah, Pachirisu is added, does not change color. And Kurokung is added, does not change color, still remains red. This is the scene right here that the character has placed down three water type Pokemon and it appears to be an overhead view and we can see that we could place a total of 18 Pokemon if you look to the top right corner and the statue effect slightly raises the appearance of water type Pokemon. Maybe, for example, this Buizel or this Piplup will slightly increase it and the Gyarados will greatly increase it. Maybe each statue has its own effects and as we can see, this orb now appears blue. So. I guess that means that, you know, the room is emanating a water effect. Down here in the underground, we now see the texture of what the rock type room is going to be. And interestingly enough, it is a rock type room, but it is filled with water type Pokemon. So yeah, I guess the the appearance of the room just remains the same. Or we're in a marsh and there's a poison and grass type. That makes sense. More poison types. Okay, so maybe the marsh is for poison type Pokemon or maybe it had to do with the statues that were placed down. It's very, very upsetting to me how small this onyx is. I cannot stress enough how upsetting it is that this is the same size as this little guy right here. Skaroopy is two feet, seven inches tall. That's a one meter tall Pokemon right there. Onyx is 28 feet, 10 inches tall, which is what, close to nine, 10 meters? Uh, why does that appear the same size as that? Very upsetting. Very, very upsetting. 
Also, if Onyx follows you, is it gonna be that size or is it gonna be a big old snakey boy? Huh? What's it gonna be? <laughs> oh, in addition, Houndoom was one of the Pokemon that did not appear in Diamond Pearl, but did appear in Platinum. I know that there was a large lack of fire type Pokemon in the original games. And then I find this scene right here very interesting because we can clearly have a lantern appearing on screen. I assume it's doing a waterfall attack and lantern was not present in the Sinnoh decks in Pokemon Diamond, Pearl or Platinum. In the original games, lantern was only obtainable in the post game when you have the super rod. So that leads me to believe that this Pokemon either is going to be added into the Pokedex, there's going to be supported Pokemon that are, you know, not in the Sinnoh decks, but are available in the game, or there's going to be the full national decks and it's going to be supported with home. It is unclear at this time which it is, and I do not believe as though there is enough evidence to make a strong assumption in any of the three different ways. And with that, that's actually going to conclude every single thing that I have found in this trailer. All of the deep dive actual facts and deep analysis of everything that there is for this game. Once again, I am going to be doing a video for Legends Arceus. I'm hopefully going to be getting that out today. If not, you are going to be seeing it tomorrow. If there's something I missed or something that was inaccurate, please leave a comment down below. That way we can all learn together. If there's anything that I saw that was inaccurate that you guys are helping work with me in the comment section, I am going to be having a pinned comment down there with any sort of corrections in the video. And again, I did not play these games originally. And before they come out, I'm definitely going to be playing them because how much research I had to do specifically for some things like this, it, at this point, I should just play the game. I might do that on my Twitch at twitch.tv slash Austin John plays. So if you want to follow on there, go for it. Uh, and yeah, guys, if you found this video helpful, do me a favor, hit the thumbs up button down below. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe, turn on notifications until next time. Austin John out.